Good morning. I'm Josephine Reed Taylor, the Deputy Commissioner for the Technical College System of Georgia. Houston Davis, Chief Acad Academic Officer for the University System of Georgia. When we gathered uh, last year, we realized that the workforce uh, needs of the future for Georgia require increased educational skills from all of the diverse populations within our state if our state is to remain competitive and if our citizens are able to take advantage of the opportunities available to help them create strong families and strong communities. As a result, we said that those of us in higher education uh, had to no longer do business as usual, but that we had to be more intentional regarding helping students access the programs within our colleges, succeed and graduate in a timely manner. We recognized the need to collaborate with K-12, business and industry, and with those of us in both public and independent colleges to meet the challenges of the workforce of tomorrow. The goals of this year's summit are to begin conversations that do several things. First, to extend and enhance the great work of uh, what we've begun in our initial plans, and as the Chancellor indicated, Georgia was the first state to uh, have all 60 of its public institutions submit plans um, to uh, Governor Nathan Deal and his staff last fall uh, to work together to understand the regional needs and identify priorities, to understand uh, that what we need to do to realize the full potential of all Georgians to align to economic needs and strategic areas of opportunity that are necessary to develop strong communities. And moreover, to hear from you uh, what additional resources and support you need to make this agenda a reality. So as a result of that, we've gathered uh, national and local experts to help us uh, lay the foundation and context for this conversation this morning and we'll have uh, several presentations, and after that, we'll have an afternoon of workshops. So we will begin this morning with uh, Houston Davis introducing our first presenter. Houston. Thank you, Josephine. This day is going to be about rounding out this conversation about the importance of completion, uh, the importance from an economic, a social, cultural standpoint in looking at the future of the state of Georgia. We uh, are, are delighted to be able to have one of the leading voices of this conversation nationally, Stan Jones, uh, the president of Complete College America, here uh, with us to kick our conversation off. Uh, Stan has uh, had three decades of uh, success in Indiana reforming higher education. He served as a Commissioner of Higher Education there, as a state legislator, as a senior advisor to the governor. He founded Complete College America on the principle that a network of states could really work together toward the commitment to substantially increasing the number of Americans with a post-secondary credential. As a member of the House of Education uh, in Indiana, he developed expertise in higher education and higher education finance. He served for 16 years in the legislature and more than five years as a senior advisor to the governor uh, of Indiana at that time, Evan Bayh. His service as Indiana Commissioner for Higher Education spanned 12 years and the tenure crossed four different governors from both political parties. Stan, it's an honor to have you here today with us. We appreciate all your support for Complete College Georgia to this day. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's going to be uh, an exciting um, a few days here. Um, I, I can't help but to remember back uh, when Governor Deal uh, in the state capitol building uh, kicked off Complete um, College Georgia just about a year and a half ago, and there's been a flurry of activity uh, and a significant amount of progress uh, ever since that day. Uh, and as Hank uh, said so eloquently, uh, when the governor says this is what he'd like, it's pretty clear what's going to happen. Um, that kind of commitment from the governor uh, is so crucial uh, to the success of Complete College Georgia. But also crucial to the success of Complete College Georgia 
as every single one of you in the room and many, many back on the campuses, uh, and even more importantly, uh, the students uh, that we are all working so hard to, to make sure that they benefit by a strong college education. Um, Complete College America, uh, we're about three and a half years old. Uh, we have the single purpose of uh, helping students complete college uh, and a single strategy of working with states. And so we're very pleased that Georgia uh, is one of our founding states, uh, not only that, but I would say one of our leading states. Uh, it, clearly, uh, with the work you're doing on performance funding, uh, the work you've done on metrics in terms of measurement, uh, and the, the fact that you have uh, campus college plans uh, uh, as of last September, uh, for every campus in the state uh, is significant uh, and unparalleled uh, anywhere in this country. Um, so you should um, be very proud of what you've accomplished and prouder yet of what you're going to be able to do. One of the things that struck me during the recession was the, uh, the fact that I think one of the unwritten stories of the recession uh, is that people were concerned about housing and concerned about people buying things. The one thing that people bought overwhelmingly was a college education. And the country uh, had peak enrollment uh, during, during this period. Uh, and at the beginning of the recession, people started to go back to school uh, and increased um, rapidly so that we had the highest enrollment in the country ever uh, during this recession. And so much so um, that it also, the freshman class also represents this country better than they ever have in terms of demographics. It's, uh, we have more low-income students, more first-generation students, more African-American students, more Latino students, um, more non-traditional students going to college than we ever have uh, before in the history of this country. All very impressive and all signifying that people in, this, in these economic times uh, have decided with their modest incomes um, and with their other family and job obligations that their big bet uh, was going back to college. And that's a huge vote of confidence uh, in colleges and universities across this country. But, w but with it, too, um, we bear the responsibility uh, to ensure that many of these people can be successful. And um, we have to ask that question, how successful have they been? And I think you, you know the answers as well as I do, that across the country, only about half of those that start for a four-year college degree complete, and only about one-third of those that start for a two-year college degree complete. And that uh, that fall class that we were so proud of, especially for the demographics, we've lost much of that uh, by the spring graduation day two or four years later. And the people that walk across the stage um, are not nearly as representative of this country than those that started in the fall. And a lot of, and a lot of the, the, the hard-won access for non-traditional students, for first-generation students, uh, we've lost along the way. They're not standing there on graduation day. The first step to tackling this problem, and, and, and Georgia uh, is there, uh, and we say this is the conditions for change. What do you need to do to start? Uh, what, what, before you can do anything else, what are the, the key factors that you have to have in place? Uh, the first of those uh, is that you have to have a goal. You need to know where you're going. Uh, secondly, you need a good set of metrics uh, to send benchmarks, uh, to educate yourself, to use them to drive change, uh, and to measure results and you have those. You need plans um, in, in order to uh, go about the business of making college completion happen, and you have that in place. And finally, you need to pay for results, uh, and you're in the process of putting together a, a pretty impressive uh, performance funding plan. Those are just the conditions of change, and, and those by themselves will not bring substantial change. And I hope today, in a few minutes, to talk about what we consider to be uh, the game changers, those four or five things that would produce remarkable results, uh, not at the margin, not five or 10 percent returns, but 50 percent returns, doubling and tripling results. The first place you have to start is on remediation, because for too many students, that's where they start. Uh, I think you know across this country, uh, too many students start in remedial work. Uh, I could be in any state in the country and say that 60% of students uh, attending a two-year college started their career in remediation. Uh, and for many open access institutions, four-year universities, it's 20, 30, or 40%. So people know that. I, I think what they don't know is for too many students, uh, their first experience is a remedial course and their last experience is a remedial course. 
they don't go any farther than that. Uh, there have been several uh, impressive studies, um, many of them done by the Community College Research Center, essentially saying that remediation is fundamentally broken. It doesn't work. Um, the studies that we've done, uh, you've participated in our 30-state collection of data. The numbers are overwhelming. Significant numbers of students start in remedial courses, and they don't finish. They don't graduate. Um, they don't even finish the first-year math and English courses. So we know that if you start in a remedial course, you have a 50% chance, you've cut in half your chances of graduation. If you start in remedial math, only about one out of 10 remedial math students actually complete a community college degree. And if you're placed in remedial math three levels down, and that's typically fractions and decimals, fifth grade math, you only have a 1% chance of getting any kind of uh, certificate or degree of any kind. And that's true across the country. So we really have structural failure here. It's not that people can't uh, teach good remedial courses, they do, but the structure of the remediation uh, is just broken. And I say that because this is really about attrition. Um, and so what happens is that when a student gets placed in a remedial course, it's kind of like the scarlet R. They really don't want to go home and tell their family they're taking remedial courses. When they're asked about going to college, they don't want to tell their friends they're taking remedial courses. And so a third of them quit, don't show for their first class. And even those that succeed don't show up for the next class or the next class, especially those that have several levels of remediation. And so we lose these students not because they can't pass the class, it's because they don't come to the next class or they didn't come to the first class and they drop out along the way. And the longer these sequences are, the math is overwhelming. Uh, even if you have a completion rate of, let's say, 70% in a course, 70% um, in the first course, 70% in the second course, 70% in the third course, you're down to 35% right there, um, let alone getting to the first level of math or English. Um, and this is where we lose the students. Um, it's, it's really pretty overwhelming. It's so true that in the study the Community College Research Center did in Virginia, uh, they opined that if, um, let's say, Hank de deciding temporarily that he was, or for the purpose of this discussion, he was smarter than I, decided that he would skip his remedial sequence and just take that first math course, and I trudged it through the remedial sequence, there's a much better chance he will succeed than I will succeed. Why? Not because Hank's smarter than me, he might be, but because he got right into that college level class and I'm still working to get there. Um, and so it's not the fault of the teacher, it's not the fault of the curriculum, it's the way this is structured, that there are so many places to drop out. Um, and that's what we need to attack. Uh, the numbers are overwhelming, uh, achieving the dream. If you start in remedial math, their surveys say that 70% of those that start in remedial math don't even attempt the first level math course for two years. Don't even attempt, they don't even get there. Uh, in Texas, they have 40,000 students start in remedial math every year. Um, three years later, they only have uh, 6,000 or 15% that have completed the first level math course. So this is all about these huge numbers and the attrition. And so we need to attack that. And if we're concerned about access for far too many students, the access is to remediation. It's not to college level classes, and we need to change that. And so we advocate, and I know in Georgia, uh, you're in the process of implementing uh, several of these throughout the state, uh, is thinking about remediation different. These students do need help, but they need help differently. Think about it as not providing remediation as a prerequisite, but as a co-requisite, simultaneous, just-in-time delivery. It can be as simple as this math course that maybe was three days a week. It becomes five days a week. Um, uh, one of the more successful courses is uh, out of uh, Baltimore, and they had their students stay 45 minutes after class for additional instruction. There are many different ways to do it, but essentially you're delivering the support at the same time these students are taking college-level classes. Um, this is the kind of thing we need to do. And we all know the placement tests cannot predict how successful these students will be. They just can't. Uh, and so over-relying on these placement tests to keep students out is not the right thing to do. Uh, and the last point I want to make on remediation is that for far too many people, we're channeling them into college algebra 
when many of them would be better off with a quantitative literacy course or with a statistics course that's much more relevant uh, to their field of study. And so we need to break that paradigm as well. Think differently about the kinds of beginning level courses that will align better with a student's program. But you have to attack remediation before you do anything else in college completion. The next big area is time. I, I like this because it's kind of um, against the grain of what we currently think. Uh, in many cases, we talk about people need more time, uh, and that's true in some cases. I, I remember my grandmother always used to refer to me as a late bloomer. Uh, even when I was in my 40s, I didn't appreciate it then. Um, but recently, the federal government came out with their first um, eight-year graduation rate. Uh, the six-year graduation rate for four-year college is about 56 percent. Um, the eight-year graduation rate was 58 percent. So those additional two years got us an additional 2 percent. Uh, if you're there at, at, at year six, uh, you may be living the dream, but you're not achieving the dream. Um, community colleges, it's even more important. Uh, we say life gets in the way. Uh, people change jobs, they, they get married, they get divorced, they have children, uh, they move from different communities. Um, every, every time change happens, it's an opportunity for people to stop out. Stopouts turn into dropouts overwhelmingly. We think, oh, stop out, come back. They don't come back. Um, especially when you have these long sequences. And so, for example, nationwide, um, it takes three years to get a one-year certificate and four years to get a two-year degree for a full-time student. Too many opportunities to stop out, too many opportunities to drop out. So what can we do about this? Um, three primary things. Number one, <laughs> that was on cue. <laughs> I'm gonna take that with me the next speech I give. Three things primarily is pay attention to the length of time it takes students, not the, not the advertised time like four years or two years, but how long it really takes students to graduate. And you need to work on that. Uh, several states have worked on credit caps, uh, 120 credit hours for a four-year degree. There's exceptions, and there should be. Um, 60 credit hours for a two-year degree. Many, many of the two-year programs have crept up uh, to 70 and 80 uh, required hours. Uh, those students are, are not going to graduate in any timely way. Um, credit, uh, paying attention to uh, credit counts, uh, students taking the right courses, uh, counting toward their degrees, uh, effective transfer policies, um, and I'm so impressed with what you've done. I think when we were first here about three years ago, Ron, we were talking about transferring two courses, three courses, and you, how many is it now? 27. Very, very impressive, very impressive. Um, but they need to count. Uh, I had this experience the other day uh, when my son-in-law had gone back to the community college, he comes back with his list, and I said, what do you have? And I, he shows me the list, and I, he said, well, every one of these, they told me they transfer. I said, well, they transfer, but they don't transfer for your program. Um, and so these would be lost credits. Uh, and so we need to pay attention to length of time and to the credits counting. Um, second, there is no over, there's no way to get around it. Full-time students graduate at three, four, five times the rate of part-time students. Part-time students graduate at a rate at a four-year college or a two-year college at about 15% rate. And it's simply because it gets stretched out so far that they can't persist. And so the efforts, and there are some strategies around having more students go full-time uh, by, by how you arrange schedules, by how you uh, work with financial aid, uh, that we can change the mix uh, and, and provide more students to go full-time. And third, and, and this is actually pretty novel, um, the idea that full-time students might take 15 credit hours. Uh, we, we have, for some reason, have a de facto strategy of taking 12. Well, that's already, you're already on the five-year plan uh, when you start out with 12. Um, and it's because of our federal financial aid policy that essentially says 12 is a full-time um, load, um, but that puts students uh, behind rather immediately. And the, and the numbers are overwhelming. It's about credit intensity. It's about accumulating credit. Uh, I saw a great presentation. Uh, actually, some of you may know Ron Henry, who was the provost at uh, Georgia State. 
and you put up retention versus credit accumulation. And you can come back, but that can be a hollow number if you're not accumulating credit. How many credits you earn is so much more important an indicator than retention. Uh, and students need to, need to accumulate 24 to 30 credit hours each and every year if they're going to graduate uh, in any kind of a timely way. Choice um, is the next major area. And I like to talk about this one because it is so counterintuitive. Uh, as there's probably nothing more important to Americans uh, than choice. Uh, we like want to go to the grocery store. We like not one kind of ketchup, but we like 57 varieties of ketchup. We like different cars, different houses. Turns out that when it comes to college, too much choice is not a good thing for college students, and they drowned in it. Um, they drowned because in many college campuses, there's one counselor uh, for 400 students. Uh, we know students design their own schedules. They say, Ron, what are you taking this semester? Uh, they look at a course title and try to guess whether that's a good course to take. Or they say, well, it's not on Friday afternoon. I'll look at that one. Um, and that's how they choose courses. And somehow these collection of courses turn out to be a degree. Um, there's a, a famous study, in, actually, that was cited in two different psychology books. We know a lot about how people think and how they behave. Uh, we don't apply any of it to the field of education, however. Um, but there are two great books. One, one's called The Art of Choosing, um, and the other's called The Paradox of Choice. Um, and uh, in both, they cite this study of, the, I call it the jam study. It's a farmer's market, um, two tables they've set up. They have six jars of jam on, on one table and 24 on the other. Many, many more people, as you can imagine, stop at the table with 24 jars. But 10 times as many bought at the table with six jars. Fewer choices, I can figure that out. Um, and this is true throughout all the studies they do in psychology. Five to seven choices people can kind of handle. Um, some of you may have 401ks after the recession. Um, they've done studies on 401k plans. The more choices you have, the less good choices you make. Either you freeze, leave your money in cash, because you can't decide, 25 choices, or you make poor choices. Um, and this happens over and over again with all the studies. Uh, the, the optimum is this five to seven, four to seven number uh, in terms of choices. Instead, we give students way too many choices. I went back, uh, looked online at my alma mater, uh, Purdue University. I said, well, if I was getting a, a psychology degree, how would that happen? And so I went to the first screen, and they said, well, you take so many courses from the core, university core. I thought, well, this makes sense. And then I clicked on that, and over 120 courses popped up to choose from. Not really a core. So then, of course, they say, <laughs> you go to the next, next grouping, they say you take so many from this grouping, so many from this grouping, and somehow that turns out to be a degree. So then I go over to engineering, <clears throat> which is what I graduated in, <clears throat> and it says, not surprisingly for engineers, the first semester, you take this. You take this calculus course, you take this physics course, you take this chemistry course, and you've got to take English. <clears throat> and the second semester, same thing. You take this. Then you choose an engineering discipline, and then it's a semester-by-semester -semester plan all the way to graduation. And there are options. You get to choose what engineering field you're in, and there's options within those fields. And there's electives, but the core path is laid out for you, and they know that you need to take it in this sequence if you're going to be successful. Engineering's not unique. Um, uh, students, they tell me, going for medical school, um, pre-med, uh, is kind of a forced march. Uh, we know at community colleges that nursing has the highest graduation rate. A uh, student wouldn't think of saying to the nurses, well, I really don't like blood. Could I skip that class and take this elective? Um, or take it in a different sequence. Um, that doesn't happen. The nurses know what you need to know uh, in order to be a good nurse, um, and that's what the faculty does. Um, honors programs, many honors programs are highly structured programs. Um, I, I, the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, I was talking with her about this, and she said, Stan, that was my first law, year of law school. I didn't choose. They told me what course and what sequences. Pretty typical for many programs, but not for many, many of the programs we have. So we say students make big choices. They make big choices to go to college, make big choices to go to your college. You need to help them make the big choice of a major uh, or a career. But after that, the faculty really knows best. If you're going to be an accountant, this is the way that you go. 
Um, and so we're strongly promoting what we call GPS guided pathways um, that lays out, you first choose maybe five to seven uh, from a five to seven uh, meta major plan. Then there's this academic map that I talked about uh, that leads you all the way to graduation. Um, these could be highly effective. Um, they even include triggers, and so if, you, if you're not successful on the plan, you have to go see your advisor. Um, and, and essentially, these are default plans. Um, and so if, um, if I start uh, the first year's courses, or I say I want to be a liberal arts, they're pretty well set for me. And I'm on that plan. I don't need permission to stay on the plan. I need permission to get off the plan. I need permission if I want to, I can take a different course, but I need permission. But I don't need permission to take the courses that lead me to the graduation in the field that I've chosen. These can be highly effective. You have one right here uh, in the state of Georgia. Georgia State uh, has some very impressive graduation rates, very impressive graduation rates for African-American students, very impressive graduation rates for Pell students. Uh, we also point it to Florida State University, uh, and Arizona State is another one. You can go online and look at their e-advisor uh, that's a tool for students that lays all this out, that also keeps students and faculty informed. Um, highly effective. Uh, and these, these colleges are getting substantial results. Substantial results for all students, substantial results for uh, low income and minority students. Uh, the last major game changer that I want to talk about is uh, structure. Uh, this is even harder for us, I think, to, to work through. Um, and the best way for me to describe it is that when I went to, um, we first did a lot of work in Tennessee, and we, uh, we met with Governor Bredesen early on. Uh, this is one, don't make this mistake, as we walked in, I, I turned to my colleague, I said, certainly he isn't gonna ask me what I think Tennessee ought to do, do in the very first meeting. Well, we weren't five minutes into the meeting, and the governor turned to me and says, well, Stan, what do you think we ought to do in Tennessee? And I was like, um, I'm not sure, but we'll find out pretty fast. And we put together a plan after touring a lot of the colleges and universities in the state. And we actually, this was pretty interesting to us. It was one of our, our best things that happened to us uh, during this odyssey. Uh, near the end, uh, getting ready for the recommendations, they set up a lunch for Governor Bredesen and myself. And knowing governors, I know that they don't have much time and they have less patience. So I know I needed to get to the point. So I prepared one sheet of paper, and um, on one side I put the graduation rates for the community colleges, which were about 15%. And on the other side of the paper, I put the graduation rates for the Tennessee Tech Centers. Some of you may know about them, but, but about, um, very few states have systems like this, but, but the Tech Centers are post-secondary, but they're one-year program. Community colleges only do two-year programs, so the Tech Centers do one-year nursing, community colleges two-year nursing. Tech centers do one-year business programs, community college two-year programs. Tech centers one-year computer science, community college two-year. So the, so the governor picks up the paper, and I didn't really call it out. He just couldn't help himself. He picks up this paper, looks at it, and says, tell me why my community colleges have a 15% graduation rate and why my tech centers have a 75% graduation rate. Why is it five times higher? And I said, well, governor, Interestingly, the students are very similar in, in terms of age, in terms of, of income level, in terms of representation of minorities. It's not that. You could argue that maybe some of them are more occupationally oriented and they might graduate at higher rates, but there are thousands of community colleges across the country that offer occupational programs that have low graduation rates. It's not that. It's the way they go to school. They go 8.30 Monday morning till 2.30 Monday. Um, they come back on Tuesday, they do the same thing. Monday through Friday, it's a block schedule, 8.30 to 2.30. They take attendance, an underrated strategy. Um, <laughs> they, it's a holistic program, much in the way I talked about nursing. It's laid out for them. They don't choose the classes, they chose the program. I want to be a machinist. I want to be an accountant. I want to be in computer science. And this is the way you go to school. Highly effective, high placement rates um, uh, in the industry. Um, and, and not only that, not only do high numbers graduate, but many, many more of them graduate uh, on time uh, or with just a little bit more. So people say, well, Stan, um, and it's also a more integrated curriculum. And so, for example, they say in machining, 
which is now quite complex. You need to know a lot of trig um, and geometry. In a typical college, they'd send these students to a trig class, and we'd only get half of them back. We'd never see them again. But teaching this in context, uh, we can have these students be successful. So people say to me, well, that's Tennessee, uh, and that's the tech centers. That's not us. We're different. So if you go 1,000 miles away, probably as different as you can be to New York City uh, from, let's say, Nashville, Tennessee, or Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, they have a program that's block scheduled. Uh, you walk in, they say, Stan, do you want to go in the morning or the afternoon? You want to go the 8 to 12 block or the 1 to 5 block? They pick your classes. They require attendance. Uh, it's, there are academic courses. 75% of their students transfer to four-year institutions. Not at all like the tech centers, except the structure. Um, their graduation rate is 55%. The citywide community college graduate, graduation rate is about 25%. It can happen, and it does happen in other parts of the country, so it can happen. And these are, like I said, these are appreciably higher uh, graduation rates um, with colleges that do this. So in closing, we can spend, I could tell you, 101 ideas for college completion. And maybe somebody's already written that book. Um, you can do a lot that will have, a, that will have modest benefits, 5%, 10% benefits, but they're only four or five what I would call game changers, significant, can make a significant difference. Um, and so if you look at them, you need to have the performance funding uh, because that makes a huge incentive for everybody uh, to align their strategies with completion and with what's in the formula. But you also need to pay attention to remediation. If we don't break that, uh, we won't be successful. Uh, the, the, the policies that we suggest, the programs that we suggest, those, do, those programs are not 5 or 10% more effective. They're double and triple more effective. Uh, time intensity, I talked about that. Going full time, those students are four and five times more likely to graduate. Taking 15 credit hours, significantly more likely to graduate. Uh, On-time degree plans, the guided pathway systems that we talked about, Georgia State, Florida State, Arizona State are getting significant numbers. And block scheduling that I just talked about, again, a quantum difference uh, between our current strategy and what can happen. All of, none of this has anything to do with the academic integrity of the institution, with the mission of the institution, with the faculty's um, creative freedom to teach their courses. It has everything to do with how we structure and deliver education. And we can dramatically change uh, our college completion rates if we implement these game changer strategies. I'm pleased that Georgia's at the forefront of this movement across this country. I know you will continue to be, uh, and I would encourage you to adopt these kinds of strategies. Thank you very much.